Still rolling? OK, great. Let me just uh, get right into it then. Um, I'm actually co-presenting with Fawad that's just getting mic'd up over here. So yesterday, you did hear about Contrail networking, Contrail security, and uh, one of the things that was promised to you is a demo. So we're going to do a demo of Contrail security. Um, and I'm going to sort of uh, just you know, lead into that by saying you know, kind of how it's important in uh, a Kubernetes context and really in a DevOps context. And for me, I mean, I back all the way up to conversations we had at the bar and stuff like that last night, really, um, when, I, when I talk about DevOps. Uh, for me, like, just how, you know, Bikash just hit on engineering simplicity. Uh, I, I'm a software engineer, you know, James Kelly, by the way, I didn't introduce myself. I've been at Juniper for 11 years. Uh, originally a developer advocate for a lot of the automation stuff. Uh, today I work in the marketing team as a technical guy, uh, keeping the marketers honest and uh, trying to promote our stuff. Right, so um, yeah, like I was saying, engineering simplicity, for me as an engineer, these are sort of twin, sometimes opposing goals. Like how do we achieve both of those things? Uh, and I think in, in networking, one of the things that we sort of talked about at the bar uh, and in various sessions yesterday as well, in the Contrail sessions especially, is we also have these twin kind of opposing goals of networking, sort of invisibility uh, and simplicity for the devs. And sort of, for me, invincibility uh, is like the way that I put like the new and frame the new role of the network admin. Um, so what do I mean by creating network invincibility? We have, this is the conversation at the bar last night. But um, as we've sort of seen a graduation from sysadmins to site reliability engineers, SREs, right? I mean, I, I sort of noticed the same thing has been happening. Um, we've kind of moved on from talking about automation tooling and technology to thinking about how we reshape our processes in building networks to thinking about how we reshape our people that are no longer network admins, but really becoming more and more true network reliability engineers um, or NREs. So I kind of like draw this parallel between the SRE and the NRE. And I think, you know, the SRE's role in sort of, if you think about an SRE that maintains, for example, a Kubernetes cluster would be the right context for the demo today. And, you know, a DevOps pro. Really what we want out of the network is to try to make it more invisible by making it as programmable, as API-driven as possible, right? Obviously, there's a lot of pure play networking use cases, you know, um, when we're building transport networks. In those cases, I mean, I think that's where the, the NRE sort of uh, shines, right? So today, um, we're kind of focusing a little bit more on the goal of invisibility and how do we do networking better for devs that are building applications. So one of the things that's really caught DevOps on fire and Agile on fire, obviously, in the past few years is microservices, right? And for me, this is just a great alignment between the goal of moving at an Agile pace and taking lots of small steps and architecting software in a way that matches that alignment. Small bullets, right, for like this Agile chamber that you want a good steady cadence. You can't get a really good nimble steady cadence of lots of continuous delivery, continuous deployment if you've got a monolithic architecture, right? So with that, you know, microservices kind of came on the scene, have obviously, you know, taken off. Um, Juniper has, as you heard yesterday, sort of entered into that market by taking our software-defined networking solution, Contrail networking, and Contrail security that we released this year, and um, really made it relevant in the microservices world, which most people think of as Kubernetes, but we also support Mesos, which is super popular for the Smack stack, uh, big data applications. Uh, we also have customers using it. They've sort of written their own container orchestration. Um, my favorite example, uh, there's tons of juicy technical details on the Riot Games blog. They're a big advocate of open contrail, and you can see how they've actually done a lot of the cool intent-driven infrastructure as code, CI CD for networking using open contrail, uh, which is some of the stuff that you know we're gonna show you today. 
Right. So in the microservices architecture, the reason why um, we're addressing it is because actually the network is more important than ever, right? It's kind of, again, this weird thing. It's like, you know, we're getting closer to the application space and the dev space that for networkers feels like it's, you know, a different land. But in that land, actually, networking is even more relevant. Um, Hopefully this is intuitive to people that are you know, familiar with microservices architectures, but really just to recap, um, I kind of think about that in this way. If you take an application that was previously uh, fairly monolithic, you know, one or a bunch of big segments, and you break it down into a lot of things, what is the air gap? What is that like intracellular space in between all of those pieces, right? Those microservices, it's the network, right? And how do all those pieces talk to each other? It's APIs, whether it's a database query, whether it's a RESTful API, gRPC, GraphQL, you name it, whatever API it's running over the network these days. So the network is super important in a microservices architecture. Um, the developers are actually realizing this because as they've broken their application apart and the network is what strings everything together, you see uh, a massive uh, groundswell around service proxies and service meshes now to uh, enable developer traceability and visibility and sort of insight of what's going on as API calls go over the network from microservice to microservice. And the importance of the network to do things like circuit breaking um, in that kind of complex architecture. So other than the air gap between all these microservices, it turns out that these microservices, when they come up, they have to sort of uh, get named and then be able to discover each other dynamically, right? So this happens with DNS and service discovery. Um, and when you have, uh, obviously those things are networking related. When you have one microservice talk to another microservice, the way that these things are fault tolerant and scale out, right, is that every tier of an application, you might call a microservice. But in reality, there's many instances of that, right? In Kubernetes, we have uh, replication controllers and replica sets for our deployments. So you might have like five instances of a specific tier of your application. Well, if you have another tier of your application that needs to talk to this set of five, how do you decide which one to talk to? Well, it turns out you go through a load balancer. So now in front of every tier of an application, you have distributed load balancing happening everywhere. Okay, another networking thing, right? <laughs> and then whether these applications are stateful or stateless, you know, at some point, you're also storing information in object storage or volume storage. Again, a networking thing. So the network is massively important in this new world of microservices architectures for many reasons. Um, so, so what are we doing with Contrail and kind of showing today? Well, it turns out that the way that people build applications, right, uh, going through the DevOps timeline of, of code to cache, um, or even concept to cache before that. When you get to code to cache, really what you're trying to optimize for is, is automation and, and velocity through what is usually called continuous practices, right? Continuous integration, delivery, deployment, and then hopefully uh, monitoring and response is not an afterthought as well. And Apps Performance helps with that area. Right, so as you go through that timeline, people usually, you know, frame it up in terms of environments called your dev environment, your test environment, your staging environment, and your prod, your production environment, right? One of the, th one of the challenges with, with Kubernetes is that a lot of people are re-architecting their applications to use Kubernetes. They're not necessarily driving high resource efficiency out of their clusters. And the reason why is because they're not using their clusters in a really multi-purpose way. If you can run dev and test and staging and production all in the same cluster, now your resource pool has the ability to be used at a much higher rate. If you can run multiple applications on a cluster, again, drive up resource uh, consumption and sort of optimize uh, for efficiency, basically. Right? Now, in doing this, one of the things that becomes complicated as we add dev, test, <laughs> staging, production, applications and projects and teams A, B, C, D, even multiple tenants effectively within an enterprise, right, teams. 
um, you start to have to deal with multi-tenancy and these different contexts within your cluster to drive up resource efficiency. This is the way you know, Google operates Borg because they're obviously obsessed with efficiency. Well, it turns out that Kubernetes has things like namespaces, user accounts, and service accounts to enable a lot of this stuff. But one of the things is if, if the network doesn't sort of match that and the security policies don't match that, then you, know, you, you end up having, again, the network and the security situation being your weakest link in your kube cluster. So with control networking and control security, obviously, you've probably guessed that we solved that problem for people. So that out of one cluster, you can really drive it to its maximum potential of efficiency and get it really multi-purpose. Um, Contrail has been multi-tenant since day one. But another differentiating factor in Contrail as we implement the CNI standard and plug into Kubernetes or Mesos is that our approach to networking has always been an overlay model too. <coughs> well, it turns out that with this overlay model, you can actually really create nice abstractions for things like dev, test, staging, and production. And one of the things that SREs and developers care about toward a goal of reliability engineering is that things like my test environment and my staging environment and my production environment have a lot of similarity as much as possible, frankly. Because when things change between staging and production, that's just another opportunity for things to go wrong in the application in production, right? Well, what would happen if you've got you know, networking and DNS context for staging and production that's all one? You're never going to have the same addressing scheme. You're never going to have the same network architecture or security architecture or policy equivalent across those things. You need to have a networked and SDN system that's multi-tenant, that's able to slice and dice your policy and replicate things so that you have the same network policy and security look and feel in test, staging, and production. And that's exactly what Contrail does. And you know, uh, just, just kind of wrapping up uh, before we go into the demo, that's what you're going to see. Um, just a reminder, right? Like This is a Contrail Kubernetes demo. It's the topic du jour. It's hot. Uh, Contrail security and networking, obviously, for VMware, for Mesos, um, OpenStax, where we sort of started, and Docker containers and Linux bare metal in general for the folks that are maybe on the video that haven't uh, tuned in to the sessions from yesterday. But I definitely encourage you to go and do that. All right. So enough from me. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Fawad to actually uh, you know, reveal the magic behind the curtain of how we create this invisibility, this great dev experience uh, with network and security policy.